Hi, I'm Nicole. And Rebecca from ConquerBooks.com. And today we're reading Gideon the Knife by Tamsin Muir, a story about a swordswoman and necromancer in space. Genius strategy. Order a shuttle and just walk out. What can I say? I'm not just a swordswoman. I'm a tactician. I don't care that you try and run away. I care that you do it badly. Listen, in less than two minutes, a shuttle is landing. I'm getting on the shuttle, closing the door, waving goodbye. There's literally nothing you can do to stop me. My parents should have smothered you in your sleep. I'd like to see him try it now, the pile of bones. Let's get one thing straight. I completely fucking hate you. You're a hideous witch from hell. No offense. Oh, Griddle, I don't even remember about you most of the time. Gideon the Ninth is this really cool story. Gothic, dark, mm -hmm. skeletons galore. Funny. Funny. Snarky. Yeah. Tamsin's got a good sense of humor, and it really comes through in the characters wonderfully. Um, so Gideon the Ninth is an orphan girl who grew up on this dark, tomb-like planet, and she's under the command of Harrowhark, who is kind of the, what do they call She's her? She's the leader of the ninth house, and yeah. so in this uh, solar system, there's nine different planets, and the planet that they're on is, um, you find out at the very first scene in the beginning of the book that it's still absolutely dark. At this time of year, they don't get any sunlight. Um, it says that you can tell what time of year it is by how hard the heat registers are working, so you get the sense that they're just kind of desolate, this like rock way out in nowhere. It's dark, it's cold, and most of what Gideon is doing is actually just in pitch dark until like the lights come on mm -hmm. in the morning. Yeah, I got the sense that they were un underground as well, so it's just like this dank hole that Gideon grew up in and she hates it and she wants to get out of it so bad. I think one thing that... <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. One thing that was really interesting about um, coming to this book, I think we were interested to read it because it was such an unusual premise. We read a lot so we're always on the hunt and look out for things that are a little bit different. And um, Nicole actually found this book, she showed it to me, and then I decided I wanted to read it too. Um, but it's marketed as a science fantasy, which I thought was interesting. Like, I've never seen a book labeled as science fantasy, have you? I've heard of it here and there. I don't think I've okay. ever actually read a science fantasy. I'm probably going to see more of it in the future. Yeah, I'd imagine. I mean, it, it sounds cool, but to be honest, after reading this book, I feel like it was a fantasy like set in space with some small amounts of space travel and like some thoughts there and there's a very powerful magic system that um, Tasman has like clearly thought out very well but I felt like overall it was fantasy not borderline science fiction. There wasn't very much science in it I wouldn't say. Yeah and it wasn't necessarily you know futuristic mm -hmm. um, a lot of the things that happened relied on on magic and like old house orders and things that you see in traditional fantasy but the setting was so new I think that's what really like pulled me on that like it was it was a fun idea that there were nine different planets nine different worlds and um one thing I relied on a lot was um the I went back to that too a lot yeah some of the names are pretty unusual y yeah and kind of long neat um she did a good job mm -hmm. coming up with her names yeah, and so each of the houses have like their own skeleton symbol, and I didn't realize it at the beginning, but it is kind of telling you what the characteristics and the traits of those houses are, um, and then the main characters there. So I really relied on this a lot, and the cover artwork is really gorgeous. Like I think that was one of the reasons I wanted to read it so much, and it really, the pages are black, so it just disappears. It's white inside, but the edging is black and it just you got the sense that somebody was really excited and like loved this book and was excited to like have you have the opportunity to read it. Yeah I think the fan base for dark fantasy is growing too that's not really horror you know there's not a lot of disgusting gore or genuinely scary parts I guess but it's it's more darkly fun. Hark and Gideon disembark to this distant planet. It was planet number one, where they live on planet number nine, farthest away from the sun. And they go to planet number one, which seems to be a, a mostly ocean planet, and they go to this 
uh, rickety old mansion. And it's like this desolate like city and like palaces. You get like this huge architectural construct in your mind. Um, one of the first things that Gideon does is she puts on her sunglasses because it's so bright. <laughs> and she's used to this dark planet. Um, and Harold Hark um, counts like the rooms as part of like her start into the trial that the Emperor has summoned them to do. And so you get the sense that it's just a completely new world for them. And this trial from the Emperor is really the, the main basis for why all these characters are coming together on this first planet. They're trying to ascend to what they call Lycterhood, and you don't really know what Lycterhood is until the end, you just know that uh, it's a mystery and they're trying to figure this out. They're kind of just on their own and good luck guys! Uh, but they're also in competition with the other houses mm -hmm. that have come, um, which is the source of a, most of the tension going throughout the book, and it's a lot of fun. It's got this drama, this soap opera feel almost mm -hmm. to it as they fight with each other. <laughs> Yeah. I'm trying to figure out who's bad and who's good. <laughs> and the characters are, are well developed because they have their own sense of who they are and the pressures maybe that their house has put on them regarding this trial, you know, how their house stands politically, what their areas of expertise are, whether it's academic, whether it's very physical, whether they have, you know, good relationship and standing with the first house already. And you get this strong sense that um, Gideon and Harrowhawk are real underdogs and like kind of mm -hmm. icky because they are guarding this tomb. That's the entire reason why their planet exists. And so you get the sense that nobody really wants to associate with them because they're the weird ones in this like cast of very strange with weird the characters. face paint and the black clothes. Yeah, they're a little bit else. too serious about the goth nature <laughs> yeah. of it. Everybody else is like. Oh, we're doing this for science and magic and you know patriotism and they're just goths. <laughs> yeah. The Lycterhood is more important to the ninth planet. Um, maybe I shouldn't say important but it's more crucial to their future than the rest of the planet so they have an extra burden going on when they're mm -hmm. trying for this Lycterhood. Yeah and you get a very good idea of who Gideon and Harrowhawk are before they leave and then um, you get all these twists and turns as they come into this trial. So they absolutely hate each other. There's this whole backstory that is pretty morbid that I think you'll want to discover yourself in, in the book. And Harrow Hawks, she has a lot of reason for being, but I would say one of her main reasons for being is like to bother Gideon and like <laughs> just hate on her and like ruin all of her plans. So Gideon's been trying to escape for a long time and she just can't because of Harrow Hawk. She just uh, keeps ruining Gideon's plans, and so they're really at each other's throats constantly. There's some really good dialogue. It was like watching this quasi-horror action movie <laughs> that's still, they gotta sit there and poke at each other the whole time. Yeah. It's very entertaining. Yeah, very comic book-like, I think, because yeah. it was so focused on having drama, but then having fun with it, having some excitement al among, along with amusement. Um, and when they get to the trials, you know, Gideon has told Harrowhawk that she's going to help her because um, they make this deal and arrangement and Gideon thinks that that's the way that she can attain like her freedom in the future. And um, through the trials they somewhat tolerate each other because they're conscious of how they present themselves in front of the other houses. Mm -hmm. um, Harrowhawk especially doesn't want anything to seem amiss to ruin her. Oh, it's Harrow Hark. <laughs> I've been saying Harrow Hawk. Maybe that's a character for another book. Some of the names are really long and you really have to look at it because Harrow Hark's full name is <laughs> Harrow Hark Nona Jessimus. So you really mm -hmm. got to sound it out. Um, and they're cool. They're kind of Greek almost, I felt like, yeah. the name she came up with. Um, but it takes a few practice pronunciations to get them down. Right. <laughs> Gideon Nav is relatively easy yeah. compared to Harrow Hark. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite characters, I think, were the teenagers. She calls them the gross teenagers or the shitty teenagers. Yeah. Um, and she just has fun with how moody and brooding teenagers mm -hmm. can be. Um, there was Isaac, who was the necromancer, the death magic. And then there was uh, Gina Mary, who was the cavalier, which is the person with the sword who does the protecting. They all come yes. in pairs. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just cute. I just liked them, even though Gideon kind of hated on them a little bit. 
even in the text itself in the book you could see like the things that they were saying were in the parentheses and like kind of tiny like you just get the sense of these like small little people trying to figure out who they are and assert themselves but they're kind of self-conscious about it so mm -hmm. they don't want to do it too much mm -hmm. whispering to each other stop it i said don't <laughs> <laughs> i think one of my favorites was um palamedes because he comes from a very academic mind set and he is really neck and neck with Harrow Hart as they're trying to complete this challenge. Um, but they both have individual strengths and his is that he is so meticulous and he's so well studied and so well read, but he also has a lot of secrets in store too. He has like this other maybe softer side of him that you see later on in the book. And it was fun discovering throughout the book what everybody's secrets were. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody sticks around. They're um, was a, a definite willingness on the part of the author to knock characters out of the running uh, via death. There's a lot of death, a lot of skeletons and bones, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, morbidity in this book, um, but maybe not necessarily like scary horror things. Like you definitely can keep reading. You're not going to go ball your eyes out. You're going to maybe chuckle along with some of the things. It had the feeling of like an Agatha Christie. Everybody's alone in this mansion. Who's killing people? Yeah. People start showing up dead, and you got to figure out who's the bad guy. Um, so that really makes it a mesh of, mesh of genres. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why they had to call it a science fantasy. They were like, I don't know what it is, but you should read it. <laughs> yeah. And you should read it because um, this is Tasman's um, first book, and she um, has really something original, unique here. She's won um, many awards for her writing, and so I think she'll definitely be an author to watch. Um, this book has actually... Um, it, you know, came out just a month or so ago, but already they're doing reprintings of it, so mm -hmm. there's a good following. And it is the first in the trilogy. Um, the mm -hmm. second coming out is just called Harrowhark the Ninth. We've got Gideon the Ninth, Harrowhark the Ninth, and I think the title of the third book should be rather telling. I'm excited yeah. to find out what it's going to be called. For the month of November, next month, we've got a plan to do some blog posts that have to do with helping writers network. Um, we've got plans to highlight small uh, indie publishers, uh, small publishing companies, uh, conferences and conventions. So that should hopefully bring a lot of resources to those of you who want to write someday. Mm -hmm. So our November video is going to focus on how to write books that have been really impactful on us. Um, we're big readers, but we're also writers as well. And um, we've both done pretty ex extensive reading on um, how to write books, memoirs of writers, blogs, videos, um, all kinds of online and in-print resources that we can share with you, some of our favorites, so that you can um, take your writing to the, the next level. So, we'll see you then. Bye. Happy Halloween.